chimney sweeper by william blake so this is very interesting poem that you have to learn so before you study this poem you should know some background details about this poem the chimney sweeper is the title of a poem by william blake so the poet is william blake so as you can see here, so this poem is published in two parts. In Songs of Innocence, you can find out a, a poem a name, Chimney Sweeper, as well as uh, in the Songs of Experience, you can find out another poem named as the Chimney Sweeper. So here for your syllabus, you have to study uh, the Chimney Sweeper as mentioned in the Songs of innocence. So especially this poem is set against the dark background of child labor that was prominent in England in the late 80th and 19th centuries. And uh, so this is the other the chimney sweeper poem. So it was mentioned in uh, Songs of Experience. This poem is not prescribed for you. You have to study uh, the Chimney Zipper poem, which was in the Songs of Innocence. Okay, so who is William Blake? William Blake was a poet and also he is a painter. He was born in London in 1757. So he, he was uh, named as a romantic poem, ro romantic poet. And uh, he's very important poet in that era. Okay, so these are some details about William Blake. So I would forward this uh, PowerPoint presentation to your WhatsApp group so that you can read these descriptions about the poet, especially the background of this poem. Okay, so another important question is, what is romanticism? What do you mean by romantic age and poetry? So especially William Blake is considered as a romantic poem. Uh, so here I have mentioned uh, kind of uh, features of these romantic poems. So especially in these romantic poems, we can see variety of images and symbols, metaphors, and vivid language we can see in these romantic poems. So when we continue our classes, we have to discuss uh, all the literary periods in detail. When my mother died, I was very young, and my father sold me while yet my tongue could scarcely cry, weep, 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 weep. So your chimneys I sweep, and in suit I sleep. So this is the first stanza of this poem. When my mother died, I was very young, and you can see uh, my, I, me. So these are the personal pronouns that you can see at the very beginning of this poem. So that you can get into an idea that, so this poem belongs to the first person, written in first person. My mother died. I was very young and my father sold me. So now here, the idea that you can get is this child is sold as a laborer by his father, while yet my tongue could scarcely cry. 
Now this child is too young to be sold as a laborer. So this child could not speak properly, even he could not speak properly, could scarcely cry, scarcely cry. Weep, 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 weep. He could only cry, but he could not speak very well, very young. So your chimneys, I sweep in suit, I sleep. So now here, your chimneys. So this child is addressing the reader. We are addressed as readers, we are addressed. Your chimneys is sweeping our chimneys. I sweep and in suit. What do you mean by suit? What is the color of suit? So usually suit is in, suit is black color, suit, dark color, suit in the sense, uh, deli, alu, ash, suit, I sleep. So due to the suit, suit in the chimneys, these children are dirty, covered with suit in chimneys. And in suit, I sleep is dirty. And also the suit, it reflects uh, their pathetic life, the pathetic, very sorrowful life that this child has to spend. So now here you can see uh, kind of uh, devices. You can see consonants and also you can see rhyme words, young, tongue, weep, sleep. And rhyme is visible here. So stanza one, the ideas, uh, the specific features that you have to learn is, uh, you have to get an idea about dysfunctional family units. I have mentioned here, dysfunctional family units at that time period, dysfunctional. The families are not organized, dysfunctioning families, especially parents, they do not fulfill their responsibilities or duties. Families are dysfunctionalized. And also uh, there are two tragic incidents that this boy had to face in his early childhood. There are two tragic situations in his life, in his early childhood. Loss of his mother, as well as being sold as a laborer. So those are the two tragic incidents in his life. And uh, this first stanza, it brings out a picture of a defend, defenseless, powerless children, defenseless, nobody to protect these children. And also powerless, they don't have any power. Powerless children or absent parents, parents their parents are no more. So those are the specific features that you can see from the first stanza. Okay, so especially you have to note the two tragic incidents of his early childhood. What are those two tragic incidents? Loss of his mother and he was sold as a laborer. So those two are the tragic incidents. And also towards the end of the stanza, the poet addresses the readers. So your chimneys, I see. Okay, so now uh, here, uh, the, the, they are chimney sweepers. So what do you know about these chimney sweepers? What do you know about these chimney sweepers? Chimney sweeping occupation. So during the industrial revolution, many people came, came to cities in search of jobs. So most of them were very poor, especially we can find out child laborers in that time period. So child uh, labor is allowed according to the existing laws, uh, rules and regulations also, child labor that is allowed. Child labor, it was seen as an ordinary thing that you can see in that contemporary society. Uh, and uh, children were recruited as laborers and also uh, they were given uh, shelter and uh, their uh, food, their meals also. 
So when considering the background, background of this poem, uh, so the, uh, there was a great fire in London. Okay, so then after that, in order to prevent such fires, they designed uh, their buildings with much narrow chimneys. So as a result of uh, designing narrow chimneys, it was really difficult for them to uh, clear, clean those chimneys and also to repair those chimneys. So that they tend to use small children to clean and repair the chim chimneys. So especially masters, masters, that means uh, kind of uh, the leaders of of these uh, labor groups. So they hired or, or else sometimes they bought homeless or poor young boys from uh, orphanages or some uh, or from some poor families. And, uh, and those children were used as chimney sweepers so that uh, they have to climb up chimneys with their brushes and other scraping tools. And also they had to collect all the swords and ash and also all the other dirty matters inside the chimneys. Uh, and uh, their masters, they sold those suits to the farmers as fertilizer. And uh, so it was kind of pathetic incident, pathetic lifestyle that these chimney sweepers had to spend because uh, actually, because of their constant exposure to soot or dust and ash uh, inside those chimneys, uh, they got sick and uh, most of them died in their early ages. Uh, and also, when we talk about that particular time period, uh, there were a lot of uh, industrial diseases. Those are called industrial diseases. So industrial, industrial diseases came uh, due to the industrialized industrial revolution in this era. So that uh, children also suffered from a lot of diseases. And also especially they suffered from uh, cancers. So that is the pathetic story of these chimney sweepers. Okay, I think that you understood. Right. So that is the background of this poem. Uh, you should know the background of this poem. If you want to understand this poem, if you want to analyze this poem, uh, you, need, you should know the background of this poem. Okay, so now here it is mentioned that uh, my father sold me. My father sold me. So once the, the, once the papers or the deals were signed, the, the, these children were left under their masters. Right? The, the, my father, paper signed Kerala, my deal like signed Kerala, my child were master to Bharati Lanama. So that, that was an ordinary thing at that time. Uh, poverty can be taken as one reason for these child labors. Another reason is, as I have mentioned earlier, dysfunctional family units. Dysfunctional family units in the society as well as poverty. Those are the two reasons for child labors. Child labors, child labors, the other reasons that my dysfunctional dysfunctional family units and poverty. So dysfunctional in the sense, parents did not pay, uh, play their role or pay attention towards their children. They didn't do their function, their task or their duties well for their children. So family is considered as the smallest unis, unit in a society. So here we can see that the smallest unit in a society is 
dysfunctioned, disorganized. So actually it is a common feature in this era, in this time period, it is a very ordinary thing. And also uh, these type of things can be taken as uh, the, ne the negative aspects of industrialization as well as urbanizations. They have become victims of industrialization as well as urbanization. So now here you can find out several techniques used, as I have mentioned here. Uh, you can find out uh, consonants and repetition, and also in rhyme can be find out here, found out here. Uh, and okay, so those are the things. Those are very important that you have to pay attention when you are analyzing uh, the first stanza. Okay, so another thing that I have mentioned here, I sweep, uh, so your chimneys I sweep and in suit I sleep. So usually these chimney sweepers, uh, they, they had sacks to collect uh, the suit and ash. Golanda sacks tibba me suit ekatukarana, deli alu ekatukarana sacks tibba. So it is said that they used those uh, sacks to sleep on. Okay, so then comes the second stanza. There is little Tom Dacry who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back was shelved, so I said. Hush, Tom, never mind it. For when your head is bare, you know that the suit cannot spoil your white hair. So now, at the very, very beginning of the second stanza, a name is mentioned, Tom Deckery. Who is this person, who is this child called Tom Deckery? So this poem is kind of a revelation about this Tom Deckery. So this is the tale of Tom Deckery. So he was called as Deckery, Deckery because he belonged to the late Deckery's arms house, or as we can call it as an open age, right? Tom Deckery to Deckery Kinanamave because he lived at an open age, which belongs to Lady Deckery's. Lady Deckery's open age kitamai ayahiti. So especially this character, Tom Deckery, this character can be uh, found out in uh, some other poems written by William Blake, Tom Deckery. So this open child's character can be uh, found out in other poems written by William Blake. Who cried when his head that curled like a lamb's back was shaved. Okay, so now uh, the poet has used a, used a simile, like a lamb's back was shaved. Now his head is being shaved. And uh, this boy is crying for that. Who cried is sad. Hush, Tom. Now uh, the, the writer tells, hush, Tom. So I said, hush, Tom, be silent, Tom. Never mind it. For when your head is bare, bare in the sense, without hair, bare, without hair. You know that the suit cannot spoil your white hair. You know that the suit cannot spoil, cannot make your white hair dirty. Now, uh, the poet is trying to console this little Tom Deckery. So that is the image here. Okay, so especially uh, this uh, lamb, it is kind of a symbol, lamb. 
So usually we take the symbol of lamp to indicate innocence. Innocence tamay api lamp kyan symbol king indicate karana. That curl like a lamp's back. Lamps get back kick wagi curl well ame hai api. So here you can see a lamp. And here you can see a shaved lamp. And yeah, how do you shaved lamp can it when do I So now here it is mentioned about the loss of innocence. Here I have mentioned loss of innocence is symbolized from this simile. So these children are being shaved by elders. It indirectly suggests that uh, these children uh, have lost their innocence with the influence of the elders. So I said, hush Tom, never mind it. For when your head is bent out, he's trying to console. Here also, you can see an end rhyme. Head said bear hair. Okay, so when it comes to the second stanza, so especially you have to pay attention towards these points, as I have mentioned here. Uh, this character of Tom Dacry and loss of innocence and use of symbol. So these are the prominent figures and this second stanza. So especially this one, uh, shaved lamp, it symbolizes the loss of innocence. It is very important. And also it has a kind of a religious connotation. According to some critics, so it is uh, representing uh, the sacrifice of lamb in the Bible, according to some, some critics. So usually lamb symbolizes innocence. And here the child is compared to a lamb and his head was shaved by elders. Uh, so it reflects that how the society spoils the innocence. So now the boy's head is shaved by elders. So it reflects the ways in which the adult society spoils the innocence of young children. Now here, the, his loss of white hair, it symbolizes the loss of, loss of innocence of this, uh, of these children, innocent children. So when you uh, continue your study of this poem, you have to pay attention towards the rhyming words, rhyme of this poem. It's very important. So what do you know about rhyme? What do you know about rhyme? Can you identify the different types of rhymes in poetry? Okay, so now we are going to uh, discuss about rhyme because rhyme is very important. When you study poetry, you should know about rhyme. And also you should know different types of rhyme. As you can see here, rhyme is a repetition of identical or similar sounds in two or more different words of a poem in close proximity. Rhyme, similar sounds. Repetition of identical sounds or similar sounds. So that is the definition of a rhyme. So you can find out a rhyme within the lines. Within the lines, that means uh, the, those are kind of internal rhymes, as well as you can find out rhymes at the end of the lines of a poem. At the end of the lines, as well as within the lines, you can find out rhymes. And also these rhymes are very important because uh, these rhymes can affect 
at the meaning of a poem or emotion or the feeling of a poem. It's very important. And uh, there are some poems without rhyme because some poets avoid using rhymes. So those type of poems can be called as free verse. They do not have set rhyme or structure. So when it comes to free verses, uh, free verse, it has very few distinct rules and it has kind of irregular cadence, cadence in the sense rhythm, irregular cadence, irregular musicality or irregular rhythm. And uh, free verse, it doesn't have any rhyme. And also rhythm is kind of uh, various rhythms that you can find out. And the placement of words, when you study the placements of words in a free verse, you can see uneven patterns, uneven, not equal, uneven patterns. And also uh, the main focus of a free verse is upon its content rather than considering about the structure or the pattern of a free verse, we have to focus on its content. Okay, so there are types of, types of rhymes. So the first one is cool, masculine rhyme pattern masculine rhyme pattern. So here it is mentioned the definition used at the end of word, words where the vowels and succeeding consonant sounds are the same. Here you can see masculine rhyme pattern. King, thing, got, shot. So you can find out this rhyme at the end of the words. And also vowels and the succeeding consonants, vowels and the succeeding consonants are the same. So those are cool, uh, masculine rhyme pattern. The next one is feminine rhyme pattern, feminine rhyme pattern. So this is quite different from the previous uh, masculine rhyme pattern. So here it is used where the correspondence of sound is in two or more consecutive syllables. So now here you can find out two or more consecutive syllables. You can refer these examples. Uh, you can find out a double feminine rhyme pattern as mentioned here. So these are called double feminine rhyme pattern. Habit, rabbit, here habit, rabbit, lightning, fightning, flower, power. So here in these words, you can find out two syllables. Habit, rabbit. So this is called double feminine rhyme pattern. So when you continue our classes, uh, we have special sessions about meter and patterns and syllables and stress syllables and stress syllables, all of those things. Okay, so then comes the triple feminine rhyme pattern. So here you can see three, three syllables, glorious, but here you can see four syllables, but only three sounds, uh, torious. Glorious, Torious, those things are going together. Those three syllables uh, are going together, glorious. Here we have to remove the first syllable, V-I-C-V, -V. Torious, Glorious. So that is called feminine rhyme pattern. Then the next one is alliteration, as you all know. So this is also kind of a repetition of the same consonant sound. So this is called head rhyme, right? When it comes to some papers, some commentaries, you can find out a word like called head rhyme. So head rhyme is the alliteration. So you know how to find out alliteration. 
repetition of the same consonant sounds. Then comes the assonance. Assonance is called the repetition of vowel sounds, vowel sounds. So that is called assonance. And the next one is called consonance, consonance. Uh, it is the repetition of consonants in a rhyme scheme, but typically this consonance occurs at the end of the words. So it occurs at the end of the words. So usually alliteration can be found out, uh, found out at the very beginning of a uh, uh, of, a, of the words, but here consonants can be found out at the end, towards the end of the words. Another one is side rhyme. So this is called as I rhyme also, I rhyme, side rhymes. So this is kind of an imperfect pattern in a rhyme scheme. So here use, uses words which have a similarity in the spelling rather than sound. Rather than focusing on the sound, here it is focused on the spellings, love, move. So the sounds are different, but the spellings O, V, E, O, V, E. So those are same, Y and V, bone, go. So rather than focusing on the sound produced by the words, it is focused on the spelling of the words. So that is called sight rhyme or I rhyme, only visible. We cannot hear this rhyme, but it's visible, I rhyme. Then comes particular rhyme called slant rhyme. So it occurs when the rhyme scheme is inextant or distant or virtual. So not accurate rhyme scheme is given here. The rhyme scheme blends and the sound matches, but imperfectly. The sounds are matching, but those are not perfectly matching. So here examples are given. Hear, call, live, leave. So the sounds are matching, but so those are not perfect. There is no set pattern to match these rhymes. Uh, this is also sometimes cool. Uh, Pararhyme. Pararhyme. So pararhyme or slant rhyme, both are same in the meaning. The next one is called off-centered rhyme. So it occurs when the rhyme scheme is placed in an unusual position within the poem. The scheme is within the poem and uh, in an unusual position. This is sometimes called a misplaced rhyme scheme. So you can find out this kind of off-centered rhymes, especially uh, in hip hop, hip hop uh, songs and rap rappings also, you can find out off-centered rhymes. When, when, they, when hip hop artists rap, they use off-centered rhyme, rhyme patterns. You know? So here you can find out off-centered rhyme, but those are not organized. Information due to confirmation. Mation, mation. But those are not organized that you can find out uh, within a poem or uh, within a song. So especially you can find out these type of, these kind of off-centered rhymes in the spoken word form of poetry. When you can find out, when, when you can see kind of a spoken word form in a poetry, you can see off-centered rhymes. 
So it is called misplaced rhyme schemes. Actually, we, did, we do not uh, care about these type of rhymes because we consider them as misplaced rhyme schemes. And there are other rhymes, identity rhymes. Whole word is repeated. Whole word is repeated, then it is called identity rhyme. Repeat rhyme. Then whole line is repeated, so that is called repeat rhyme. And also echo rhyme occurs when the same syllable endings are utilized. So when the same syllable ending, not the, uh, not the word, but the same ending syllable, disease is, 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 you can find out the same syllable here. So those are called echo rhyme because the same syllable is, syllable is going to echo. And also you can find out mirror rhyme, another type of rhyme occurs when words are used that don't exactly rhyme, but are reflections of one another, right? And the another type of rhyme is homonym rhyme, homonym rhyme. So actually it happens uh, with the uh, pronunciation. Pronunciation might be same, but different meaning. So the words, these words bear the same pronunciation, but the meanings are different. Now here you can find out flu, flip, do, do. So the meanings are different, but when it comes to the pronunciation of these words, we can see kind of some kind of similarities between the pronunciations. So those are called homonym rhymes. Okay, so now uh, you have to get back to the poem. So we are going to discuss the third stanza. Uh, so when we analyze this poem, it is very important to know about the rhyme. And so he was quiet and that very night, as Tom was sleeping, he had such a sight. And so he was quiet and that very night, now, this is the tale of the story of Tom. It was quiet and uh, he was sleepy. He had such a sight. He had a dream that thousands of sleepers, thousands of sleepers, it represents the number of problems, the number of other suffering people in this society. Thousands of sleepers, other suffering souls in this society. Dick. Joe, Ned, Jack, other sleepers, other children, suffering children, were all of them locked up in coffins of black. Were all of them, all of these chimney sweepers, all of these suffering children were locked up in coffins of black. Now, they were locked up. So it shows the current situation of their life. So they are in prison, they are confined in this social injustice. So especially by using uh, these type of images, coffins of black, black. So color black, it, it is kind of a symbol of death and also miseries. So coffins of black. So what are these coffins of black? So these coffins of black reflects, reflect uh, their deadly occupation, their occupation, their job. It is kind of uh, very, uh, yes, deadly occupation. So they are locked up, they are limited, they are confined into their occupation. They cannot get rid they cannot go away from their occupation. It is kind of a big burden for themselves. They can't say no and they can't get away. They can't escape. So in this third stanza, it is very important uh, to see the great number of victims of social injustice in this society.
So when it comes to this word, that thousands of sinkers, it shows the number of the victims, victims, victims of the industrialization. In most of the case, these victims are suffering children at that time. So suffering children in that society. Now, who are these suffering children? The thousands of sweepers, sweepers, these sweepers. So they are abundant children, abandoned by their parents. Uh, most of them are orphans and abused children. And uh, their child labors, exploited by their masters. And they're socially marginalized. You can use that term, marginalized people, children and affected by poverty, malnutrition, and diseases. It's very important. Earlier also, I mentioned about industrial, uh, industrial diseases in that era. So here we can get the idea that uh, these sufferings or social injustice are not only for Tom. Tom Tavitrak me make a TNA. There are thousands of people, thousands of other Zuebers are also suffering. So Dick, Joe, Ned, Jack. Uh, so they are few among those suffering groups. Okay, so then uh, the fourth stanza. And by came an angel who had a bright key and he opened the coffins and set them all free. Now here, an uh, arrival of an angel. Angel. He symbolizes the religion, messenger of God, or uh, yes, or religion, angel, who had a bright key. What is this key? Key to the gates of heaven. And he opened the coffins and set them, them refers to these sweepers, them all free. So this freedom is all about their freedom from the sufferings, their miserable lives. Then down a green plain, green plain, it symbolizes the freedom and prosperity. No worries there. Then down a green plain, leaping. Now these children are leaping, they're jumping, laughing, and they run. They're playing, they're very happy. And wash in a river and shine in the sun. They were washed in a river. So this line has kind of a religious connotation. They were washed in the holy river. And also uh, from that bath, all of their sufferings or sorrows were removed, were wash, washed off, washed in a river, washed from the holy river and shine in the sun. So now they, they are shining in the sun. So here you have to see the contrast between the previously mentioned color imageries and also now color imageries. So earlier it was mentioned about coffins, black, but now bright key. Earlier it was mentioned about uh, darkness, black, but now shine and sun is mentioned here. So the stanza four, it is all about relieving children's sufferings and also uh, their heavenly life. So that might be after their death. For stanza is very important because it's religious connotation and also the symbolism used in the fourth stanza. So usually, uh, yes, angel symbolizes fortune, happiness, and salvation. Salvation, yalavima. So according to uh, Christianity, angel symbolizes fortune, happiness, especially salvation. Salvation from the sufferings. Salvation from the miserable lives. Salvation from sin. 
So it has a religious connotation, uh, it should be noted. And angels are found in Christianity, earlier I mentioned. So here also an angel comes to free out these children in order to free out, set them all free. free But this is only a dream, okay? So this is the sight seen by this boy. This is only a dream seen by this boy. So here coffins, coffins, and he opened the coffins. He refers to the angel, opened the coffins. Coffins symbolize their sufferings and uh, exploitation. What do you mean by exploitation? Surah Kam, they are exploited by their masters exploitations and also their sorrows miserable lives and also their deadly occupation their miserable life and set them all free so angel could save them from their miserable lives so uh, when do these angels come Usually, uh, they come after one's death, no? To take that dead person's soul into the heaven. So that is their duty. That is uh, their duty to take uh, the souls of these dead persons into the heaven. So now this stanza uh, symbolizes death. So when considering their lives, when considering the lives of these innocent sweepers, child laborers, the only way to have a relief is to die. Relief Before death, they cannot have any peace or happiness in their life. So that is the pathetic situation in their life. So this imagery of this angel, Angel uh, setting these children free. So that means only the death can make them happy. Only the death can take them away from their miserable lives. Okay, so next comes the fifth, uh, fifth tensor. The naked and white, all their bags left behind. They rise upon clouds and sport in the wind. And the angel told Tom, if he'd be a good boy, he'd have God for his father and never want joy. The naked and white. Now who are naked? Now these children, sweepers, naked, naked from their dirt, dirty matter, suits, then suit nangi. Because they were washed in that holy river, naked, out of their sufferings, free from their sufferings and free from their dirty matters, corrupted society. The naked and white, they're white now. So you have to pay attention towards the color, color imagery is white. Earlier they were with black coffins and black suit. But now white, it symbolized pure, pure nature of these young children. Now they are away from the corrupted society so that they are pure now. All their bags left behind. So their bags of suit. And also it indirectly uh, tells us, hints us about the bundles of sufferings or worries, their burdens in their life, their workload in their life, bags left behind, a workload, like bundles of sufferings. Now they are very, uh, they're white, they're pure, they're clean and they're naked. They are out of the corrupted society. They rise upon clouds their eyes upon cloud. So, because now they are very light. You know the meaning of light? Sahaloi. They're not heavy with the burdens. 
They are not heavy with their bundles of sufferings and heavy workloads. They are very light creatures now. So now they rise upon clouds. Clouds were talked about. So this, these clouds are metaphoric. And a spot in the wind. Now they are plain in the wind. So now here, as I mentioned, the image of clouds floating freely is Blake's metaphor for the freedom from physical world. Now they have got freedom from the physical world. Now they are about this physical world. Physical world, they are uding tamai in clouds tamai. They are far away from the physical world sufferings, and their light, their souls are light. Harmasahan know that, and they are playing in the wind. And the angel told Tom, the angel me ata podi message bakhi ano. If he uh, if he he would be a good boy, he would have God for his father and never want joy. If he'd be a good boy, he'd have God for his father and never want joy. So this is very important. So what do you know about this particular pattern? What do you know about this sentence structure? So this is kind of a conditional uh, sentence pattern and it is used to talk about unreal, unreal situations, dreams, to talk about our dreams. So it is only unreal, unreal thing to have God for their father. So it is only unreal situation. Okay, so as you can see here, if he would be a good boy, he would have God for his father and never want joy. So that is the statement given by the angel. Okay, so the angel told Tom that if he would be a good boy, he would have God for his father and there would never be lack of happiness for him. There would never be lack of happiness for him and never want joy. Now it is mentioned as never want joy. Joy, joy won't, never want. Why is that? Because already you might have Joy or the joy thing on an eye, it's a happiness only when in any and never want joy. You'd never ask for happiness. So, what does it suggest? What can you tell about the structure or the pattern of the sentence? So, this is a conditional sentence. So, it is the second condition, conditional, and its mood is. Mood is called subjunctive mood of mood. So usually we use uh, this mood, subjunctive mood, to express speaker's attitude, suggestions, uh, especially attitudes and suggestions related with unreal conditions, unreal situations. So now here, how can Tom be a good child? If he would be a good child, actually, it's unreal condition for Tom. So working without complaining and accepting all the injustice upon them as God's wish. So that is the way to become a good boy. Then Tom the good boy can equipment to work without complaining. Kissima complain without complaining. And also he has to accept all the sufferings and all the social injustice he has to he has to accept 
he has to accept them as God's wish. Ameke Deviyangi Kamatta. He has to accept. If he complains about the sufferings, workload that he gets, he cannot be a good boy. Right? Hamadam Karan de burden ne kakvi de tame, chimney sweeping, harima karadarai, harima maru, harima mahansi kalahetua. He cannot be a good boy. Rather than complaining on the uh, workload or his, uh, his sufferings, he has to accept everything as the wish and the will of God. The Vian Mahan Sege came at the Mekai, Matadun Mekai Kela, like a Pilagan. Or as he has to accept it as kind of a uh, examination or a punishment done by God. Natan Devi Ma Pariksha Karano Natan Devi Ma Punishment Te Kak Bila Kela. Anyway, we have to expect, uh, we have to accept all the sufferings. If he doesn't accept those things, he cannot be a good boy. So when it comes to Tom's life, it is unreal for him to become a good boy. It's very difficult for him because of his setting. He has a lot of workloads to complete and also he has a lot of sufferings and uh, he, he is spoiled by the elders. He has to live in the corrupted society. The society is corrupt. So he has to move with this corrupted society, other adults, so that how can he ever become a good boy? Koma they are good boy can explain. So here, uh, in a way, William Blake is critical about the way religion is used to hide the social injustice at that time. So from this line, William Blake is critical about the use of religion in order to cover up, in order to hide social injustice in that society. Social, actually, uh, when we discuss about the use of religion in that time period, most of the cases, uh, religion was used to cover up, to defend the existing social injustice. Tiena social samaja asadaran, social injustice. Tika arak shakaran, cover up karan, religion yoskala. How did they use religion to cover up? social injustice, exploitation. Uh, that is the wish of God. Uh, so you can't go against the will of God, the wish of God. You cannot complain. You can't ask questions about that. This is the way that you were born according to the wish of, wish of God. You cannot question. You cannot question. Yes, the rich people, they, they have money because that is the will of God. You can't complain about yourself. You can't complain about your poverty because you are being examined by God. You are being punished by God. So that is the reason for, for your poverty. That is the reason for your suffering. So all of these social injustice, uh, and also the sufferings and uh, malpractices, malfunctions, all of these things were justified, cover up, covered up by using religion. Now here, when you study the language of this particular, uh, particular line, so it is about an uh, unreal condition. So there is a condition here, but it's not practical when it comes to Tom Decker's life. It's not practical. It's not real. Uh, so it is mere a hypothetical situation. So we use uh, this type of condition to talk about hypothetical situation.
Right. So in this fifth stanza, uh, here uh, the angel fails to save Tom. Uh, so that this angel gives him a false hope. So this is kind of a hope, but it is a false hope. Uh, because uh, being religious or spending virtuous life without complaining is impossible for these chimney sweepers. Because they're suppressed from this existing corrupted society. Okay, so then comes the sixth stanza, the last stanza. And so Tom awoke and we rose in the dark. Now here, dark. Again, dark color imageries are used. And also this dark, it uh, reflects the early morning. And got with our bags and our brushes to work. And got with our bags. Now they are getting ready to go to work with their bags, bags in the sense, uh, so they are sacks, uh, sacks. And also we can take these bags as uh, their burdens, their heavy workloads and our brushes to work. So these are the equipment that they need for their occupation. Though the morning was cold, now the morning was cold, Tom was happy and warm. So here you can see the contradiction. Morning was cold, but Tom was happy and warm. So it might be due to the previous last night dream. So Tom is happy and warm because uh, he, had, uh, he has got a new hope for his life. So if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. So now here, again, another conditional sentence is used. But this is a real condition. So if all do their duty, if all of these sweepers can do their duty very well, they need not fear harm. They need not fear harm. So this condition is possible and real when it comes to their life. If they, can, if they can work hard, if they can fulfill whatever the duty that they were given from their masters, they won't be harmed or hurt by their masters. Okay, so this sixth stanza, it shows the reality of the sweeper's life. When it comes to the fourth and fifth stanza, so those were about unrealities of this uh, sweeper's life. So after waking up uh, from their fairy dreams, so they have to get ready to go to work by taking their bags of suit and brushes. So this last line is quite important. So if all do their duty, they need not fear harm. If they do their duty well, if they work on honestly and hard, they will not get any harm or hurt by anyone. So that is the reality of sweeper's life. Because if they do not uh, uh, if they do not clean the chimneys well, or if they do not work well, uh, they will be hurt or harmed by their masters. Okay, so that is the idea presented in the last stanza, stanza number six. Okay, so now we analyze uh, this poem by William Blake. And uh, now we are going to focus on the specific points in this poem. 
So especially uh, in this poem, towards the end of this poem, we can see an antithesis between the vision of sunshine in heaven and the dark and real world. So we can see an antithesis between uh, the vision of the heaven as well as uh, the darkness in the real life. Okay, so in that uh, antithesis, by using that antithesis, poet evokes irony. It's, it's ironical to see uh, the situation in heaven as well as the situation in this real world, and especially how uh, God blesses us towards the people in this real world. So it is kind of ironic. So uh, when it comes to the last stanza of this poem, uh, we can understand that uh, the angel's message is not realistic. And also it is kind of useless because it's difficult for these sweepers, these uh, innocent uh, poor sweepers to become good, good boys uh, because uh, their innocence was destroyed by the elders. At the very beginning of the poem, you can find out that their innocence was destroyed by the elders of the society. Okay, so you have to pay attention towards the structure of this poem and mainly the rhyme scheme of this poem. It's very important. And also the main focus of this poem the pitiable condition of the uh, chimney sweepers and uh, exploitation and bondage labor, child labor and sufferings of open children at that time era, at that era. And major themes of this uh, poem can be taken as uh, innocence or sufferings or misery, death and hope. So those can be taken as the major thematic concerns of this poem. And the other things which are visible in this poem is word pun, use of word, weep for sweep. Most chimney sweepers like the speaker cannot pronounce the word sweep. And it signified the pathetic state of the child labor. So actually, I think that you can remember at the very beginning of the poem, it was mentioned that they could, uh, they could not speak, they could not pronounce word properly when they uh, when they had to start their lives and start their occupation as uh, sweepers at that time uh, they could not pronounce the word sweep very well so that we they pronounce it as whip and rhyming couplets it's very important and in German metonymy and assonance alterations and first person narration of this poem and the use of visual imageries and symbolisms. Those are key features of this poem, as well as similes. So when it comes to stanza two, you can see similes and the recurrent imagery. So this imagery of suit, it is kind of a recurrent imagery, repeating imagery throughout the poem. And also white hair. So those things can be taken as the visual imageries and also the symbol of slam. It is also very significant when it comes to the stanza two of this poem. And stanza three, you can find out hyperbole, thousands of sweepers. So some critics uh, argue that it is kind of use of hyperbole. The poet has exaggerated the number of suffering people in the society, thousands of sweepers alliteration and other visual imageries and metaphor of coffins. And the passive structure, the sentence structure is passive. We're locked up. If you can remember that particular stanza three, we're locked up. So it shows the passive nature, backward nature of these children. They're not active, they're passive, they're backward. And uh, the color symbolism is very important, black or darkness, it symbolizes death or evilness of the society, of the, of the corrupted society. 
And uh, when it comes to the fourth stanza, angel is used as a symbol of the religion and also can be considered as a messenger of God. And bright key, so here, uh, the use visual uh, visuals are very uh, colorful, bright, bright key and green plane, green plane. So these type of visual imageries are mentioned. So these are positive imageries. When compare the previous visual imageries, pre previous images like coffin, black suit, those are the kind of negative images. But now the use images are positive. And kinesthetic imageries are used as leaping, laughing, running, and washing in a river. So a lot of uh, actions are presented here. Then comes the fifth stanza, metaphor, their bags uh, are metaphoric because it reflects the burdens of their hard work, the, the heavy workload that they have to fulfill. And also other visual imageries and kinesthetic imageries are like rising upon clouds and a sport playing in the wind. So those are uh, remarkable. And also there's a parable. And the angel told him, if he'd be a good boy, he'd have gold for his father and never want joy. So it's kind of a parable. We can take it as a parable, right? This conditional sentence. Towards the last stanza, again, uh, the dark symbolism is used in this last stanza of this poem. So those are the specific features of this poem. So we analyze the poem. And also we uh, identified the specific features of this poem written by William Blake.